I say, let's talk about the speed of light. And you say, I've got no choice, right? I say, yes, you've got no choice. 24-4, state the predicted and observed speeds of plane electromagnetic waves propagating through vacuum. That's just a lot of words to talk about the speed of light. James Clerk Maxwell was the fellow that came up with this equation. What he did is he put together Faraday's law, Ampere's law, um, Gauss's law, and Gauss's law for magnetism, some of which we've talked about already, Faraday's law for sure, um, and Coulomb's law, which is related, and he studied the propagation of electric and magnetic waves. He found that these equations of electromagnetism predict a wave with an electric field and a magnetic field and a direction of uh, propagation that are all three perpendicular to each other. And he found this relationship for the speed of those waves. At that time, Maxwell's calculations, this is 1865, nobody, well, he didn't know what they were. He was just looking at electromagnetic radiation. We, we didn't know at the time that light and radio waves, etc., were electromagnetic radiation. We didn't know what light was. And so he, he did these calculations. He came up with this relationship uh, for the speed of electromagnetic radiation as 1 over the square root of mu naught times epsilon naught. Well, these are both um, parameters, quantities that you know about already. Mu naught, well, epsilon naught is 1 over 4 pi k. So if you put a 1 over 4 pi k in here, the 1 stays in the denominator, and the square root of 4 pi k ends up in the, in the numerator. So that's our epsilon naught that ended up as a, as a 1 over 4 pi k. Well, we can plug in the numbers. Uh, 4 pi, there's the 4 pi here. k is about 9 times 10 to the 9. That's that Coulomb force constant, constant, which is one of the very first constants that we learned this semester. 9 times 10 to the 9 newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. And then mu naught. 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 tesla meters per amp. Well, what do we get? The 4 pi's cancel. We get 8.99, which is about 9. We get uh, 10 to the 9 over 10 to the minus 7. Well, the 10 to the minus 7 in the denominator becomes a 10 to the 7 when you put it up in the numerator. So we'll have a 10 to the 9 plus 7. And that's 10 to the 16. So we got a number that's around 9, and we got it 10 to the 16, and the units, if you put all these units together, you end up with meters squared per second squared under the, uh, under the square root. So when you take the square root of meters squared per second squared, you're going to get meters per second. When you take uh, the square root of a number that's around 9, you get a number that's around 3. And you take the square root of 10 to the 16, that's 10 to the 16 raised to the 1 half power, that'll be 10 to the 8. So it's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. At that time, there had been some rudimentary measurements of the speed of light. And this is what Maxwell said when he finished this calculation of electromagnetic radiation, which was not known at the time to be related to light. And he compared the predictions of his calculation with the rudimentary measurements of the speed of light from that time. And Maxwell said, this velocity is so nearly that of light that it seems we have strong reason to conclude that light itself, including radiant heat and other radiations, if any, he didn't know about gamma rays or x-rays, um, is an electromagnetic disturbance in the form of waves propagated through the electromagnetic field according to electromagnetic laws. And then in 1988, Heinrich Hertz did some measurements that confirmed Maxwell's conclusions. So this is one of the greatest triumphs of early physics, to 
compare this theoretical calculation with actual measurements and then understand something that had been a part of Maxwell and Heinrich Hertz's lives and everybody else's life. Everybody knows about light, but suddenly now they understand it better. They know that it, it's made of electric and magnetic fields and propagates according to electromagnetic laws. About how many times faster is the speed of light when compared to the speed of sound? Well, what's the speed of light? It's 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. What about sound? About 344, 343, 344, depending on the temperature, humidity, etc., meters per second. Well, what's the ratio of those two, C over V? Let's just call this 300 meters per second to make the numbers a little bit easier. 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second divided by, let's just say, 300 meters per second. Well, the threes cancel. We get 10 to the 8 divided by 10 to the 2. 100 is 10 to the 2. So that's 10 to the 6. The ratio is about 10 to the 6. So that's 10 to the 6 is a million. And so about a million times faster. That's why, as we talked about before, the, the, the visible lightning arrives much quicker than the audible thunder when there's uh, lightning in the air. All right, diffraction of AM and FM radio waves. This goes back to uh, chapters 16 and 17 where we talked about diffraction of sound waves. Light waves are our waves too, do they have diffraction characteristics? Well, we remember, we, you might remember that sound waves diffract when their wavelength is large compared with the opening or the obstacles that you're talking about. Let's look at light. Well, sound waves have wavelengths that are of the order of meters and centimeters and that sort of thing. Not so with light. They're like nanometers and a, a nano so for example, green light, well, let's just look at red light, 700 um, nanometers uh, is 700 times 10 to the minus nine meters. That's very small. Um, so KUSU is an FM station. It broadcasts at 91.5 on the FM dial. What, what FM dials read is megahertz. What's a mega? 10 to the 6. So this is 91.5 times 10 to the 6 hertz. There's that number expressed in, in physics terms. The wavelength is related to the speed and the frequency. As you remember, C equals F lambda. Same as V equals F lambda. We're going to solve that for lambda by dividing both sides by F. So that's this equation here. We're going to take the speed of light in the numerator, divide it by the frequency of that uh, KUSU FM, and we get a, a, a wavelength of 3.3 meters. So these radio waves, they're pretty long. They're about the size of this room um, for FM radio. What about AM? KVNU is 610 kilohertz. What's kilo? It's 10 to the 3. So there's that number expressed in terms of, of regular old hertz, 610 times 10 to the 3 hertz. Uh, speed of light is the same for all forms of electromagnetic radiation. And you get a wavelength of about 490 meters. These are radio. Radio waves. Visible, much, much smaller. Uh, ultraviolet, even smaller, etc. But these are pretty large. And so uh, these guys having the longer wavelength, the AM, if you compare their wavelength with the size of obstacles like hills or houses, the AM waves are like the deep sounds uh, by the bass drum in the band that we did that example. They're like the long wavelength sounds. They can get around obstacles better than the, than the FM sounds. 
So these guys, uh, AM, get, get around obstacles better. Um, and therefore, AM signals are able to broadcast over longer distances. They're also easier to decode. The, the coding of AM and FM is, is different. Um, but FM signals are less susceptible, to, less susceptible to noise and give higher quality sound. So um, we still use both AM and FM in our world today. Uh, FM don't quite go quite as far, but have a little bit higher quality signal. All right. How far does light travel in one nanosecond? The answer is one light nanosecond. It's this distance right here. Now what do I mean by that? If the speed of light is denoted by C, which it is, that'll be a distance divided by time. If you solve this equation for the distance, the distance will be the speed times the time. Speed of light is approximately 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. One nanosecond is 1 times 10 to the minus 9 seconds. And let me get that in our brains. That is 1 billionth of a second. That's a very, very short amount of time. If you multiply those two numbers together, you get a 3 out in front. A 10 to the 8 times 10 to the minus 9 is 1 is just 10 to the minus 1, which is 1 tenth. So you get 3 divided by 10, which is 0.3 meters, which is the same as 30 centimeters. So this is uh, one light nanosecond. In 10 to the minus 9 seconds, that's how far light travels. But if you take it up to length and uh, up to scales, which we're a little bit more familiar, and you look at how far light travels, in one second, then you can easily work out that the light will go around, if you had enough mirrors, the light would go around the world seven times in one second. Looking back in time, let's talk about um, a supernova explosion that occurred in the Tarantula Nebula. It's it's fairly near to the Earth. It's uh, distance 1.66 times 10 to the 21 meters in the Large Magellanic Cloud, as I remember. It might be the small one. But it's uh, a nearby dwarf galaxy to us. And the question is, why do astronomers say that viewing an event like this is like looking back in time? So there was a, a star that, that burst in that cloud. It was 10 or 20 years ago, as I remember, and that star uh, rivaled in brightness the entire uh, brightness of the galaxy. And so um, we'd like to know how long ago that occurred compared to when the light arrived at, at, at us here at Earth. Well, the distance is uh, the speed times the time. We can solve that for the time by dividing through by C. So the time is just the distance divided by the speed of light. The distance we're given is this one, speed of light we know. Plug in the numbers and you get this number of seconds. That's a lot of seconds. So let's convert that into to years. One year is uh, 365 days, one day is 24 hours, one hour is 60 minutes, one minute is 60 seconds. If you do all the cancellations, then you get an answer, and this second cancels this second here, you get an answer in years of 175,000 years ago. So when that event was, was seen, if, if 10 years back or whenever it was, the individuals who saw that event through their telescopes were seeing the event that actually had occurred 175,000 years earlier. And so it was long old news <laughs> by the time we reached, we received information about that event. The um, Andromeda Galaxy is the nearest uh, large galaxy to us. 
it's in many respects, as far as we know, very, very similar to our own Milky Way galaxy. It's 2.5 million light years away from us. What's a light year? A light year, Ly for light year, is the distance traveled by light in one year. So a light year is a distance. And it's equal to a speed times a time. The speed is 3 times 10 to the 8 The time is one year. And so what you can do to find the distance in meters, you can work it out, is convert the year to seconds, the same kind of conversion we did in the last slide, and that will give you the distance in meters. It's such a fantastically large number that I never remember what it is. It's about uh, six, as I remember, about six trillion miles. And um, this object, the Andromeda Galaxy, is 2.5 million light years away. So when we view the Andromeda Galaxy, we are seeing it as it existed 2.5 million years ago. That's amazing, especially given that you can actually see this galaxy with your naked eye. Far and away, the Andromeda Galaxy is the most distant object that you can see with your naked eye. If I get some of you out on a dark night, I can show it to you. But it's visible in the fall, in the evenings in the fall. So next August, when it's nice and warm, uh, get out with somebody you care about and look for the uh, Andromeda Galaxy. How do you find it? A lot of people know about Cassiopeia. It's a W shape in the sky. Um, so that looks like a W. This part of the this side of the W is kind of shallow. The deeper part of the W is the one that you want to focus on. I think about that one being a, an arrowhead that points to this star. It's called Beta Andromeda. Andromeda Galaxy uh, connects up with what the so-called square of Pegasus. That's another way to help you find it. But this is the easiest way that I know of, where you have uh, these three stars in Cassiopeia that point to this bright star here. Then if you look up uh, and to the left of that bright star, there's a dimmer star. And then the Andromeda galaxy is about the same distance again. So you go this distance to that smaller star, this distance again. And you'll see, uh, it's easier to see with binoculars, but you can also see it with your naked eye on a clear dark night. You don't want a full moon. Preferably, no moon is the best time to look for the Andromeda galaxy. But it is an object that's 2.5 million light years away. And you can see it through binoculars or with your eyes, only it's just a little hazy spot. It looks like an out of focus star. And you might say, well, hang on, maybe that's just a cloud. But then the clouds move and it's, it's still there. It's not a cloud, it's a galaxy. And it has maybe four, two to 400 billion stars, the combined light of all those stars that comes to, um, uh, from the galaxy.